Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so let me tell you a story about something that happened after our last uh, conversation. I uh, have a friend who sets up house shows for music and he likes singer songwriters. And there's this interesting website where you can kind of open your house to uh, artists and then ask them to kind of show up at your house and play. And then you promise to sell a certain number of tickets. And it's really a cool thing. And this, this guy, this guy's name is Clem Slade. I think his name is Snides, Clem Snide. And he's kind of a B level guy. He's not like a top level guy, but he's a singer songwriter, real soulful from the East coast that my friend had gone to school in the area where he was, he was really popular. And this guy happened to be traveling over here. And so he has a house show with this guy. And he's really, really good artist, but I'm setting up to watch. I'm kind of in the front row of this little house and my son and I are there waiting to, for him to get going. And he's kind of warming up and he's kind of looking at me sideways, you know, and I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And then he says, you know, do I know you? And I said, oh, I don't think so. You know? <laughs> and then he said, you're Dr. Jim. And I said, Dr. Jim, I knew exactly what he was talking about. He had seen me on our conversations and immediately we were friends and we were talking about how this guy had seen me on your show and it was all of a sudden this just conversation with him i was like the i was like his best friend at the show so it was really cool and uh and so there's there's this weird thing going on out there that's insane i mean yeah. these these videos get a thousand two thousand views yeah. that's not a lot yeah <laughs> And so he's driving, what he does is he drives around, he has bigger shows in places like Portland and Seattle and bigger places. And then between those shows, he'll drive around and do these house shows. And that was just, it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Wow. Wow. That's that, you know, whenever something like that happens, it, because again, I mean, really there's 300 plus million people in the United States. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of people. And some people look at my, oh, you get lots of people. But 1,000, 2,000 views, right, that's yeah. nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, that was fun. That was fun. So this, that's crazy. this thing keeps, keeps rolling on, this thing you do. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I, I, I still sometimes I think, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? This is a little <laughs> insane. But it's so much fun. Yep. And it's, it's been so meaningful. And it's opened up lots of interesting opportunities and and more interesting conversations than I ever could have imagined. So yep. I'm I'm not stopping. Yeah, and you're you're still holding my interest, you know. You know, uh, uh Jordan's kind of drifted in the background a little bit because of his troubles. Hope hope the best for him there, but um you still hold my attention, I'll tell you that. So. Well, I, you know, I think about that a lot because you know, okay, so I look at I look at the analytics that come through and it's like you can see, you know, waves go up and down. And I watch myself watch other YouTubers and I'll watch this person pretty intensely for a while and then over here and then over there. I mean, that's sort of how we are. It's kind of the order chaos mapped, unmapped dynamic. So I, I'm, I'm glad I don't do this for a living. <laughs> yeah. Because well, I you, know, assume... you, you really get a sense of how fickle the market or the mob are. Yep, yep, yep. I and, could see so, it just dropping off all of a sudden that's on right. somebody and then they've banked a lot on it and it just turns out not to be the fad of the next phase and there they go. Yeah, and I think about that with respect to Jordan. So yeah, he hasn't put out he hasn't put out product because he's, you know, obviously got yeah, what much more important stuff to take care of. But you know, so Jordan was this, you know, huge thing for a moment. And then the question is, you know, will this last? But then the other question is, will there be another, you know, when he comes back, how will he be? What will he talk about? You know, he certainly struck a nerve. I mean, the man and moment met each other at a time and, and, and really, you know, broke open a lot of other cool stuff. So, yeah. I mean, we can, yeah. we can only be grateful. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So I kind of got fascinated again by you when you took a turn a few weeks ago with the group B, group A oh, yeah. thing you did. You're, you're kind of a wanderer, you know. You, I am a real then wanderer. And now, ADHD. <laughs> you went, <laughs> went off in two or three different directions between then and now. But, but that's a thing that's close to my kind of, uh, I don't know, my, my world because of, because of what I do as a physician. And, and it... it kind of made me think I'd be interested in having a conversation with you about that, about that topic. So that's, that's how I got this going. Well, I, I think there is something to the fact that both of us work with people. 
Yes. And both of us, well, especially you as a physician, because in, in so many ways, physicians demystify and disenchant our bodies, which is, you know, you go, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you these things and it's like, is that true? Is that me? Because the me I experience is this, again, this sort of, this sort of um, uh, non-decaying autobiography that goes through time that is the center of my story. That's me. And then there's mm -hmm. this body that's aging and losing hair. And, you know, my sister died. So now I have a cardiologist <laughs> because, you know, my sister and my father both died of heart attacks. So now you know, I, I don't have any heart trouble, but yeah, yeah. I have a cardiologist yes, now. Exactly and, right. and so bit, I said, go ahead. Bit disconcerting to, yes. to live in that world. Although I would say, and, and that's kind of the area that I'm interested in kind of exploring a bit. Um, because in a way, for me, I live within it so much that I kind of get to a sense, a place where, you know, I don't really have that cognitive dissonance between what I'm doing um, with the patient, the patient as a whole person, the patient has autonomy, the patient is a, a full-fledged uh, agent, they have, um, they, they violate the determinism of the, of the universe on a regular basis, they're part of a story within their family, they're part of a story that is their, their narrative of their lives, and yet I'm thinking about what's happening to them mechanistically and in fully naturalistic and materialistic terms, which is, of course, exactly what I should be doing. And in a way, when I'm dealing with patients and engaged one-on-one -on -one with the whole activity, there isn't cognitive dissonance, you know, right at that level. And that's, I think, interesting to note. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a direction I was going to take this, and I can guess I can run with that for a minute, and then I'll, yeah, I'll let you, you think about it. So I was going to, I was going to, pull out a kind of example that's more ordinary than maybe the heightened intensity of my, you know, kind of work with patients and illustrate some things and kind of move towards a claim that I'm a card carrying naturalist and materialist. Um, but then move beyond that. Talk about something, some way in which I'm more than that, let's say. So, so I'm playing soccer with my son and we're kicking the ball back and forth. And, you know, as the ball's going through the air, I, you know, we take it to be the case that that's happening, you know, in a fully naturalistic and materialistic way. Or let me put that in a little bit of different terms. The ball's going to travel invariantly in a certain way. And, and I recognize that. I know that to be the case. And I use the word invariant rather than using words like deterministic or bound up in causal relations uh, because I want to emphasize the point that we take it to be that without any of that thought. We recognize it as that. And we also see the ball and its environment as, you know, not having agency or let's use the word inanimate. And so that, so those two words, invariant and inanimate, I want to kind of stand in for the direct experience of these more kind of abstracted things that we take to be the case, uh, or that we maybe question sometimes, like naturalism or the kind of uh, iron box of causal relations or, or the laws of nature or, uh, or the materialistic view, which was the second kind of uh, uh, the inert nature of it. So I don't have to evoke anything like, you know, some atomic theory of matter or, or any, you know, any of that in order to be, in, be recognizing that it is that. And so, uh, and in maybe one more step, it's, um, it's unexceptionally that. And what I mean by unexceptionally here is that might be illustrated by my reaction to anomalies so if the ball's going back and forth, you know, and then one time it hits the grass and boom, it goes off into a weird direction. I do not say that something from outside that little field of action came in and broke in and made it do that. I say, there must be a reason for that. Or I search out the reason for that. And I find that there's a sprinkler head there. It hit the sprinkler head that I didn't see. And 
that's what is the case. So even in the case of an anomaly, you, I see my own intuition, my own instinct to say that it's, that it's contained within this field of what I've called invariant, uh, inert, and unexceptioned. And again, the reason I say that is that I want to emphasize that we, we know it that way or we engage in it that way before we do some sort of rational reconstruction of that that layers on some other level of thinking about it, some abstract level of thinking about it from some theory of science or some, um, and, and that's kind of a starting point. I have other directions to go from that, but that's kind of a starting point. Of course, at the same time, I'm playing soccer with my son and he is a person and he's got agency and he's going to kick the ball where he pleases. <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, I regard him as someone I'm, I recognize. He, he recognizes me as a full fledged person. We have relationships of dependency. We have histories. All those things are there as well. And they're there in a kind of uncomplicated way at that, at, at that level of engagement. So that's kind of my starting point. I don't know if you want to throw in some comments. Well, about yeah, that, I think that's really, I, that's a really lovely illustration. And, and we can even pursue, let's see, the spirit of geometry into your son, because let's say you kick around the ball quite a bit with him, having mm -hmm. done this many times. On one hand, you don't, you don't demythologize him as an agent, yet over time you learn his habits and his patterns and you learn if the ball comes this way he likes to approach it this way if there's this move he likes to make this move and 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 so you just have this you know you just have these probabilities that you seamlessly work in your head and of course when he gets to the level of professional ball players not only you know they watch tapes of each other they study each other and they learn let's say basketball they learn that this guy always likes to you know cut to the right and and head down the lane, but, and so you learn that and you practice that, but when the guy does it, the defense doesn't even sit, there's not time for the defense to sit and say, okay, he's heading down the lane. They just respond. And so in fact, practice is all about taking all of this, all of this rational cognition and somehow embedding it more deeply in these processes that we aren't fully in control of and off there. So this is a, I love this illustration, so keep going. Right, so, you know, you could, you could evoke a Verveke term, participatory knowledge here. I mean, we're just, we're fully, or Heideggerian, we're embedded in the world, we're being in the world, and that, in that sense, is, is not complicated. But, and, and so I want to say something else like, you know, this thing we think of as materialism and, and naturalism, you know, it's not a, you know, the result of, you know, some dyspeptic, you know, dead white men in the, in the 16th century kind of wanting to foist upon us some, you know, kind of uh, annoying theory to ruin our mood today. You know, that, that, that something happened in the Enlightenment that shifted something, and I have a kind of idea about what that is, but, but at some base level, this is a perennial problem, not a, not a new problem. This is, this is, this is obviously going to go, we can say it's a modern dualism mind-body, but we could use the word spirit-flesh, and we're probably saying very much the same thing, and we could look at Genesis 2-7, and the Lord formed man out of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and we're probably talking about something very similar. And um, so... So in a, in a way, there's a dilemma there, and I think there is a modernist dilemma there, which I kind of want to move towards, but this is, this is the, the baseline circumstance that has probably been in some sense at the center of our experience and our attempt to work out our experience, uh, you know, going, going a long way back. Well, I think that's right, and I, 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 like, I like how you set it up here because it, it and then so on one hand we're observers of this and we reflect upon this we don't just observe and participate we're now doing this in the sense of self-transcendence where mm -hmm. we're reflecting upon it and then there's also the desire within us well what is that desire well we would like to know this well why would we like to know this well because we we have a we have an intuition that knowledge of this affords us 
power, opportunity, control, security, because we also have a, a, very, a very real appreciation on our cautionary side that you know, there's a reason we say people don't like surprises. Now, people do and they don't like surprises. They like pleasant surprises. They don't like, you know, and, and, and with your illustration, I did, so at the beginning of the, of the Australia conference on Jordan Peterson, the organizers of the conference set up my conversation, just a brief conversation with um, uh, James Anderson, the former deputy prime minister of, of, of Australia. And before, you know, before I went to Australia, someone had clued me in, said, you should watch this video about him. And it was an interview that when he, when he was a boy, he was playing cricket with his father and he hit a ball and the ball that he hit killed one of his siblings. I mean, just a tragic, tragic accident. Jeez. But but here's, you know, on one hand, we have this father and son kicking around a soccer ball on a on a on a lovely afternoon in the grass, and it's it's all good, and we can do self-transcendence and reflect upon all of this stuff. At the same time, we know that even in a father and son, you know, with a bat and a ball hitting it around, bang, tragedy happens. And that tragedy, you know, for better and worse, sets someone's life in a different direction. So it's not just a ball hitting a sprinkler. And deep down, we know this. Yes. It's, it, you know, and we know this with car accidents. We know this. Uh, we're just doing something mindless and bang, the world changes in an instant. And it all seems to be, you know, balls in gravity on lawns. So, right. so there's, or, there's real stuff at stake with this for us. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, the, the notion of um, my patient as, you know, as organism, my patient as, you know, complex biochemistry and electrophysiology, you know, that is something in a certain sense my patient is bound up in and, and governs, to use your word, and I'm going to act within that world, you know, uh, you know, assuming all of that in order to hopefully have a sense, you know, as a, as a culture in medicine of understanding what health is and trying to recognize, you know, suffering as, 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 a, as a consequence of this, you know, kind of materialistic uh, vision and, and make decisions, but those decisions and are not only, but at least partly and heavily materialistically based, naturalistically based, based decisions to try to achieve those goals. And so, yes, I, I totally agree with that. I, I, I had studied a guy um, from the 16th century who's a kind of underappreciated scientist, William Harvey. And the reason I, I studied him was that he was the first guy to correctly describe the circulation of the blood. Huh. But his, interest, his interesting place in history is that he was a contemporary of Galileo. And so Galileo was the purveyor of, of, of the Copernican revolution. So now we're looking out at the stars and we're seeing how the Aristotelian vision is kind of uh, not going to hold, hold out. And Harvey at the same time was really taking that same vision and turning it to the organism of the, of the body. He was, he was taking this organ, the heart, which, which of course had carried all this, the kind of Aristotelian um, meaning uh, uh, in that world to our very, uh, our very selves. You know, I mean, what, what was the heart back then, but the heart of the matter, but the center, in, in a certain sense, the center of the universe, because the human being was at the center of the universe, right? And this heart was this kind of source of heat and action and and, and animation of, of, our, uh, of our being. And he described it as a pump. He described it as a mechanical object. And, uh, 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 and this, you know, this at the time, Descartes actually reflects back on Harvey as a very big influence to him. And I think it's interesting to, to, to speculate a little bit as to why we don't put Harvey in the same kind of place that we put Galileo. Because Galileo can be seen heroically, the stars can still have wonder in a certain way, but boy, you get getting a little personal if you're talking about about the very organism that we that we are. 
and it's, it just these are these are things to I don't know reflect on and see oh, how I, that. I, yeah, I think that's I think that's uh, I, that's so amazing, and I, you know, so I, you know, as a pastor, as a pastor in a kind of moderate denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, you know, doesn't go off into into creation science or any of that, any like that, even though there's a lot of people in the Christian Reformed Church that are fairly literalistic in Genesis. And so the CRC is kind of a moderate and all those things. And, and so, and so I always, I, I'm just such an annoying person in many ways, <laughs> because I say things I shouldn't say. And, and I'll, I'll ask some people, I'll say, you know, you want, you want, you know, you want someone to have a, you know, a biblical a biblical cosmology? What do you want someone to have a biblical anatomy? Do you look mm. to a literalism in the Bible to human anatomy? Because yeah. the Bible has a variety of side comments about anatomy within it. So do you go to a doctor and you say, I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a biblical literalist from a doctor, and I want you to treat my Bible <laughs> as the way the Bible describes the body. And, yeah. and that's just such a deeply disturbing you know, and so what yeah. I find is that a lot of creation scientists and and highly literalistic people act as if their um you know their doctors, uh, their doctors, you know, it's just it's we're we're not being fully honest with the world, and so I right. love this. I I knew nothing about this man, but I think you're exactly right because it's far more disturbing for us as little centers of the universe <laughs> to imagine that the thing that keep is keeping us alive is a pump. <laughs> right. Right. So that's you know that I I find that all that fascinating. Um, let's see where and, and I don't know where to go with it. I do I do think it 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 frames my worldview, and I don't want to say that I you know kind of don't still. Um, I'm not still able to, to, in my own idiosyncratic faith, uh, I think completely, um, I wouldn't say square, but completely embrace, let's say, our incarnate uh, reality while still maintaining my faith. I do think it makes my faith pretty idiosyncratic, at least the way I see it. I, I think I, I, I don't know how ultimately, and I mean, we could potentially talk about how I square all those circles, but um, I don't think it's the same as my fellow parishioners. Let's put it that way. Probably not. <laughs> and, well, you know, so. Well, um, pastors, pastors are popularizers. And right, so, right. you know, what, what you tend to try to do is give broad answers that satisfy a majority of your people, at least to the degree that they won't act up or leave the flock or something like this. And so pastors have all of their own conflicting agendas going on with, with herds and people and institutions and organizations. So I, I would be, you know, because it, it's funny because I play, you know, as a pastor of a, a congregation with a lot of older people, so what the way the script goes is that the you know the person comes back from the doctor and the doctor says well you've got these things going on and then of course the people come to the doctor and say well what does that mean and what they're looking for usually some kind of time frame and ability frame and so the doctor and doctors for the most part do their best to say first of all i don't know but they forget the i don't know yeah. part <laughs> and then well, they listen I I really try not to forget that I don't know part, but no, no, yeah. no the doctors don't forget yeah. it. The patients yeah. oh, forget. Oh, it. right, right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Because yeah. I see them on the other end of it. I'm not in there with the doctor hearing what the doctor right. says. Oh, sure, sure. I hear what the person reports the doctor have saying, and so then they will give an answer, and I will often remind. I will often say something to the effect of, "Well, um, that's true." Let's, but let's, let's. What I, as a pastor, will tell you is that your life is in God's hands, and he will, he will decide the he day. Will and, and then I will, you know, then I will leverage my own story. I'll have to say, you know, my father, my father fainted for some strange reason. And then, you know, was under, you know, intensive scrutiny by his, his general practitioner, his heart doctor, he was in a heart monitor, he did all of that. And then, you know, it was two or three days after they had taken off the heart monitor because everything looked <laughs> fine. Bang. He, 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 he drops dead of a heart attack in the middle of having 
coffee with someone in a pastoral conversation across the table. And it's like, well, <laughs> and then the, yeah. the poor doctor is like, you know, my, my mother didn't hold any ill will, but the poor doctor's right. like, you know, I, I, we did everything, right? We did we, everything. Yeah, yeah. But there we are. We don't, we don't control the, the whole show. <laughs> we don't and, control the whole show. And in fact, the, even with as far as our knowledge progresses, you know, that, that just tends to open up. You know, I love the way it was Neil deGrasse Tyson made a point. He said, you know, the progression of knowledge actually also magnifies the amount that we don't know because that's, that's just simply how progression of knowledge works. I, I would say there isn't a single day almost when I'm taking care of patients, seeing lots of different patients, where there, there aren't numerous circumstances in which I don't really get a handle on exactly how things are and how do I explain that. And, and it's for a variety of different reasons. It's for, you know, it's for limitations of our testing, maybe limitations of our theories. Uh, just the circumstance of the patient won't allow certain things for me to do to, to get to that. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why there might be mystery around what's happening. Um, but it's, but it's always ever present that we're not, you know, we're not covering the field. We're not, we don't, we don't have the landscape completely laid out, uh, often. And, and yet you, and not unlike, clergy you you work in a highly liturgical setting i mean you dress <laughs> a, a certain way, it, yeah. way you speak a certain way there are liturgies you know i always reflect on this because now i have two doctors not one yeah. so, and my two doctors don't always agree so my one doctor says talk to the other doctor about this and back and forth we go it's like i you know well, yeah. and, the, and i feel fine which is right. exactly what my father said the day before he died so <laughs> but but we have all of these liturgies and, and, and so it isn't even just, you know, it isn't just you and the patient and the chemistry or the science of, of the patient and their health. It's, you know, completely within an entire world. And so you are always dealing both with the spirit of geometry where here's all this hard science and here are our metrics and, you know, this is your, these are your this is numbers. what we can do. This is what we can't do. Right. And, and it's also the spirit of finesse where you're looking at, you're, you're trying intuitively to see as much of the picture as you can in this tiny window of their life and, and wade in on an aspect of their life, which is life and death, pretty important for all of us. And in, in a way that, you know, it's, 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 un, it's incredible what we're doing. Yeah, and and we all, you know always try to keep the the caring for um, the person, you know, at, at the forefront of, of of what you're doing. So the goals and the and the intentions and the and the meaning for the patient is always very much in front uh, of what you're trying to do. So so the fact that there's this other kind of uh, uh, scientific way of of making decisions does not shield that or, or, or make right. that un, uh, uh, any less important. But. Well, you don't undermine their agency, but at the same time, I would imagine their agency is, their agency is almost always an enormously complicating and sometimes frustrating fact. I mean, I, I, if, when I listen to my primary care physician, you know, I'd really like you to lose this weight and I'd really like you to eat this way. And, you know, he's got all these, you know, things that he'd like me to do. And I'm not the best patient in the world, but I'm not the worst patient in the world. And, but then I see it from his point of view and I think, gosh, I don't know if I'd want his job because <laughs> working with people. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you do it every day, I'm sure. But it is true. Uh, particularly as a cardiologist, I see, Essentially, well, probably not exactly, but essentially everybody. I mean, there's there, there's pretty much no one who doesn't come my way eventually, and um, <laughs> and so you see a very kind of I think a very broad populate broad cross section of, of the population. So you see a lot of different kinds of people with different ideas about what's going on and different ways of handling it emotionally and and uh, and intellectually, and so you have to be there for all of them and try to be the thing they want you to be that's that's kind of a part of it as well you talked about the liturgy or the or the you know the way i dress or whatever there's a certain 
sense of, of being, um, you know, being confident for them, being, being, uh, having a, a assurance for them that helps everything. Um, anyway, the, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, this, this split vision kind of idea is, is kind of the way I was kind of wanting to wander. And uh, to illustrate this, I was, I, I would bring up a guy named uh, Wilford Sellers. Now, I, he's a philosopher from the middle of the 20th century. I don't recommend him really as someone to read because he comes from an analytic tradition. But he kind of undermined the whole analytic tradition by, by at, not attacking, but um, undermining the, the idea that science could be purely based on empiricism. And he did that from within the analytic tradition. So he kind of stopped, in a certain sense, you might think of him as a guy who stopped the analytic dominance of, of philosophy in the, in the American you know, uh, um, academia. And uh, there's, a, there's a quote that I would read for him that kind of goes parallel with this and maybe evokes in your in your mind that first couple of sentences of Maps of Meaning with the field of objects versus arena for action. But he wrote a book called The Philosophy, Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man. And I'm getting this from the, the Stanford Encyclopedia page. Um, Philosophy and, and, and the um, Scientific Image of Man describes what Sellers sees as the major problem confronting philosophy today. This is the clash in quotes between the manifest image of man in the world and the scientific image. These two images are idealizations of distinct, distinct conceptual frameworks in terms of which humans conceive of the world and their place in it. Sellers characterizes the manifest image as quote, the framework in which, excuse me, the framework in terms of which man come and came to be aware of himself as man in the world. But it is more broadly the frame, framework in terms of which we ordinarily observe and explain our world. The fundamental objects of the manifest image are persons and things with emphasis on persons, which put normativity and reason at the center stage. According to the manifest image, people think and they do things for reasons. And both of these can occur only within a framework of conceptually excuse me, of conceptual thinking in terms of which they can be criticized, supported, refuted, in short, evaluated. So that's the first posture that he takes on the manifest image. But then he makes the following claim, which is kind of where I wanted to go here. As comparing that to the scientific image, which he doesn't describe more, which isn't described explicitly here, but it's, the, it's what we were just talking about. And so then the, the quote goes on, Sellers claims that the scientific image presents itself as a rival image. Hmm. From its point of view, the manifest image on which it rests is an inadequate but pragmatically useful likeness of, the, of reality, which of, the rea of a reality which it first finds, as, um, so let me try that again, useful likeness of a reality which first finds its adequate in principle likeness in the scientific image. In other words, the scientific image has within it a kind of impulse towards totalization, an impulse towards being all there is, the, the, the whole show, if you will. And, and I think that's in the description that I gave in terms of this unexceptionalness or this lack of exception. And I think that's kind of where it, I see kind of a problem or the problem arising, which is that um, it, which is that we have a temptation to move towards Sam Harris, let's say. We have a temptation to move towards a sense that things in the manifest image are not quite as real as things in the scientific image, or to put that another way, the two images entail a kind of ontology. So if we, if we see the ball behaving the way it is, coming along with that is the ontology that things are material, that things are bound up in this. We see on the other side, the persons and their, and their ontology, the ontology of that world, which is persons and agency and free will and, and all of that. 
but there's a kind of intuition that we have, and perhaps an intuition that this might have been inherited through modernism as, per, as perhaps different from before, which is that we set up a hierarchy of being. There's a hierarchy of being rather than, rather than a kind of easy coincidence of things, as I described in, in playing soccer with Kevin. There, when we reflect on it, when we step back, what we do is we start to see things like, well, gosh, you know, free will doesn't seem to be consistent with the scientific image. And that means that I have to put the scientific image at some level of more substantial ontology. And now I'm demoting the manifest image and I'm seeing it as somehow less real. And I'm starting to wonder about terms like emergence to explain it. And now, and ultimately I, arrive at Sam Harris where the self is an illusion. And I see that word illusion when he does that. I don't know if you know that spiel that he has where he, he says something like, you know, the, the, we know the biochemistry of the brain and we can see on the MRI that this stuff is happening and that stuff is happening and we can see in the anatomy that that stuff is there and that means that the self is an illusion. And that's that same move. And illusion in that sentence functions as a deflationary term. It, 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 it relegates our, our direct experience of the world to a lesser status in terms of ontology. You cannot have an ontology that excludes things from existence. Non-existence is not a reality it's just another category of existence and and therefore it's an it's just a way of kind of with superlatives and with emphasis um describing something as having less claim on reality rather than i i, I don't know if you followed all that but oh absolutely i think i think the modernist turn in a way has this temptation to set that hierarchy that up that way, and we inherit that, and then we struggle with it because of that, rather than, rather than being able to embrace the, you know, the, the, the alternative. Well, I, uh, that's so. excellent. That's excellent, and you'll have to send me the send me the link to that yeah, quote because people will people will very much want to read that because I let me that's try to do that while we're talking here. Okay. Yep. That, that's that's tremendously helpful because the the irony, of course, is that as I think Peterson notes and many others, uh, we 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 act as if the manifest image is the truer image because we can't do anything else. I mean, and so that then sets up this conflict where and. This morning, this morning I was watching. So rationality rules. I don't know if you've seen, know who he is. He's a guy yep, out yep, there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So rationality rules. Just Google served up upper left hand corner first video in my feed. A rationality rules video with this Greta girl from from Sweden or Norway, from Scandinavia, and Jordan Peterson. I thought, yeah, I know what Google's doing <laughs> that. So I, I was working on. I'm working on a video about the movie The Joker, which I saw last night, which is a. I saw as well. Did you? I, oh, <laughs> that crazy. movie's a masterpiece. Anyway, um, crazy, yeah. So, so rationality rules is is doing his thing. And of course, rationality rules in some ways epitomizes or at least aspires to epitomize the scientific image. That's, that's his whole shtick. Mm -hmm. And, but what's happening now and that video is about climate change of which I am not a skeptic, but that video and a number of other videos are demonstrating that climate change is the near perfect challenge to modernity Right, I've heard this argument for you. Because it's it's a conflict and, and with the with the with the, the things that you just put on the table here, because it's near perfect conflict between the manifest image for which I can't see climate and the scientific image. So you have all the scientists saying, This is going to kill us. The manifest image shows no danger. And so you know, all the rationalist people are saying, well, we should rationally address it this way. Oh, but to do that will uh, quite likely, first of all, we probably can't do it because most of the carbon emissions are actually going to come from China, India, Africa, and the developing world. 
And so your real question is, well, just how much violence are you willing to threaten them with in order to put them under a, a neo-colonial totalitarian regime that has everything to do with carbon? When almost no one in that world is thinking in the scientific image that even hardly anyone in the first world, which is the most educated, the most you know, colonized, thinks in. And so you can't, you can't win this political battle in the developed world. You know, it's basically, we're looking at this thing saying, hey, you know what? We're screwed. We have And not to mention the fact that you don't know what to do. That's right. That's right. <laughs> even, <laughs> even within the scientific image. That's right. And so, you know, when I, I was looking at that, I'm thinking, well, yeah, well, this is, this is the end of rationalism in many ways, because either way this thing goes, rationalism loses. And, yeah. and, but, but there we are. And I, I really love what you just read now, because I think that very, very clearly lines up the relationships and shows the kinds of conflicts that are, that are just playing out again and again beneath all the turb turbulence that we're seeing. Yeah, and I think the, it's one place where I can kind of feel like we have a, kind of a reserve of agency is, is, this, is this sense of, um, of setting up our, our ontological hierarchy. It, because we, you know, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to think of ourselves as, you know, uh, insubstantial. We, we, can, we can, we do, in fact, think of persons as wholes, even if parts of them no longer uh, partake, you know, someone uh, breaks their leg or God forbid has a stroke. And I hope we're all thinking that that person is still the same person and that's deserving of all of the, of the compassion and or rights and or all the things that we attribute to, to them as, uh, as full persons, including our our uh, our love for them and our belief in them as as you know as fully substantial in just the same way before they lost one of their parts, so you know th that um, that's a that's a normative um, um, demand that plays only in that arena of our our ontologic choices, or our choices about what we take to be existent and important. And um, so I, you know, so that's where the manifest image is. You know, we gotta not get tempted, and I use the word tempt tempted on purpose, not get tempted to, to dismiss that, so. Well, yeah, well, and so not, you know, how do we, how, how do we manage both image? Because obviously at this point, um, uh, we're, we're, we're not giving up the scientific image. No, I mean, we're, I mean, because our, our lives depend on it and right. many, many aspects here in, you know, here in Northern California now, uh, last year we had the paradise fire, which was likely caused by sparking power lines in the, in the North winds that we get every year. And so, oh, well, big, you know, big electric, not, not, not a lot of people have a lot of love for PG&E for whole hosts of reasons. <laughs> and so the state of California was going to hold PG&E accountable for all the loss in those fires. And they weren't going to let PG&E slip out of it if they went bankrupt. And so this year, PG is just turning off power and in many areas of Northern California yeah. when the winds are high. <laughs> and, well, oh, this is a very astute scientific move to make. But now, um, in terms of the manifest image, people get up in the morning and the power is out and they worry right. about their milk in the, in the fridge and people have medical equipment in their homes and people have to go to work and they discover that the gas station is closed because the gas pumps don't work without power and, 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 right. and. And so... No, this is a this is a wonderful way of 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 setting up the dilemmas that that we face because we we're not about to discard the scientific image. No. We can't, but we well, neither and can partly we because the it's image. right exactly. And the and the question is how do we, you know? I I don't know that there's any answer to these things, of course, but but um, but uh, it does seem like we've we've moved to a place where the the these these priorities have have been inherited by people, and it 
and it foists a burden on on a lot of uh, a lot of people that I think the let's go back to John Bravaki the um, the psycho technologies that we have available are not quite up to you know navigating um, and we don't and, and maybe they never were you know that's that's part of the deal maybe we don't you know maybe maybe we struggle to be communities that can that can uh, make decisions uh as communities with the kind of priorities that i don't know i don't know i, I hate to use the word should that that we should uh, <laughs> um maybe we never were able to do that but but uh but it certainly seems like uh i don't know we should <laughs> you know well we should and and you, you know your your image too as again as a pastor one of the one of the increasingly common and yet trying dynamics that you see in families is our memory issues and memory loss of of parents and loved ones and you know it, it's when it comes to you know as we're seeing now in the the golden age of brain science these issues when it comes to the brain they they get accentuated because in many ways I can, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier for me to differentiate myself from, let's say, my ticker, my little pump in here, because, oh, well, maybe you can, because pump, well, maybe put another pump in if, if all it has to do is pump the blood. But when it comes to this thing that's generating the autobiography, and, and now suddenly I can't remember, or there's a stroke and and I see this fairly often, then there's a change in personality after the stroke, along with a change in capability. Uh, then people are looking at, you know, well, I've, I've, lost my, I've lost my husband. And my, my husband is still there, but I've lost my husband. And I mean, yeah. you know, these are huge issues. Yeah, I think we, uh, this kind of dovetails into another direction I had thought of going into, which was to, cr to critique Jordan Peterson's half of the, uh, you know, field of objects versus arena for action. And I, I think arena for action is probably wrong. And, uh, and the reason that arena for action is wrong is that it's no really, in a certain sense, it's no different than a field of objects. That is to say, actions aren't in themselves. They don't have any value. So, you know, you can take the field of objects and you can say, you know, I can stack up a bunch of objects in a lot of complicated different ways, but it just turns out to be a stack of objects. <laughs> and the same is true with actions. You can put a sequence of actions, all sorts of complicated sequence of actions together, but it's only a sequence of value neutral actions until you do something else. And so I think you get to Nietzsche with, with um, that formula. Now, I don't, I don't think, Jordan Peterson is doing this because he obviously moves quickly to meaning and goes into other directions. So I'm not wanting to lay this on Jordan Peterson, but simply saying there's a starting point that the, that the fundamental essence is, is action, I think leads to a power kind of dynamic. And I think we move to something else. I, I toyed with the while for, with the term care, which is a Heideggerian idea that, that it's a field that we care about. Things are things are things, things that we care about and then we act based on our care. But I even go to a, another level that I think your comment raises and that is that our essence really in our, in our, in our manifest images is, is dependence. We, we are either, de we are, e we either have people who are depending on us or we are dependent on others. We are dependent in our very nature from our big, from our origin to our, to our, a final act and we that's the dynamic we're in even with the neutral or however you want to describe the universe or the absolute we are dependent in our kind of central essence and recognizing that i don't know may make a bit more sense out of out of the manifest image i don't know i think it's really good you know it's you know, so Verveke goes with his um, relevance realization as as kind of a. I think it's a more, I think it's a more developed 
it's a more developed alternative to action because it's fuller, especially yeah. when it puts the two words together because that second word has a double aspect to it. It's mm -hmm. both mental and it's physical and because realize has that double dynamic in English um, and in, and in some other languages as well. Um, but, but you're right that, that a, you know, a sequence of actions is, can be just as valueless, which isn't as, as a sequence of, as a pile of objects and which is what the, you know, one of Jordan Peterson's favorite illustrations of the Nazi prison guard having, having, you know, prisoners haul sacks of sawdust back and forth across the factory floor. Yeah. I mean, that's the image of it, that the point of the story is a valueless exercise in order to reinforce valueless, but there is in fact care behind that. And then the question is, well, what is, that we're back into meaning, we're back into value and, and the quest for these things and, and attempting to square, I mean, in some ways we're back to Hume's is an ought yeah. that we're, we're working on the intersection of these and again it's it's all of these it's it's all of these things that we bump up against mind matter is ought I and mean, these things tend to line up fairly well heaven and earth in some ways ah, i think that's and, right and and so we're working through those things no that's that's really really helpful yeah and it worries me that that power also or, or let's say action can seem to have a, a quality of, that we would honor in the form of, of, of competence. So competence might be thought of as, as hey, that's a way that, that, um, that this I can be more comfortable with or something, but I don't really think so because, because being competent, we're not always competent. Sometimes we're not competent. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes we're weak and sometimes we're, uh, ultimately relegated to being passive and being dependent on others. And so we can't, uh, plenty of us are not competent. And we have to see ourselves in that, in that relationship with each other. And we can't just, well, it's, we can't just judge people simply based on competence. You know, we, well, um, <laughs> co competence so we have, has, yeah nested within it a telos a goal right. an end right. i mean it's yeah. always competence towards something, something. Yeah. and and again it's it's the telos and outcomes that especially in the secular frame we are so bad at because yeah. secularity by setting itself up you know wants to wants to push those things away which leaves jordan peterson with a sort of internal internal compass of meaning but I really like I really like your your point on dependence, which of course is is deeply biblical, in right. that the I mean, what is man? Well, man is like the flower of the field right. that flourishes, is full of glory for a moment, but then its place remembers him no more. Yes. I mean, and and you just you look at the artistry of you know, of course, this is something that that I as a pastor. I read this a lot with older yeah. people, and so as we're, as we're in, a, as I'm trying to facilitate their negotiation with their often impending death, you know, this is so we go back because on one hand we want to leverage the promises of the Bible for meaning and purpose and never-endingness that 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 is the promise of the religion, but at the same time there's the there's a realization of the religion that this, this thing that you have feared and, and you rightly have kept pushing away, that's, um, this thing is an inevitability that, that you will not win, no matter what action, no matter how many objects you line up. <laughs> that's right. And I, this goes to a kind of an image of the cross that I think might be somewhere in the, in the, in the Girard Rene Girard thing, but you know when uh, the way I one of the ways I frame the the crucifixion is a kind of a kind of declaration. Well, let's say let's say we're in a field of action and we're um, and we're Peter in the garden, and and the 
the soldier comes up and and is it, he sees this is it this is the beginning we're going this is this is the fight we've been preparing for and he pulls out his sword and he says let's go and uh that would and gerard i don't know if you got to that point in the gerard com, uh, uh comments but gerard frames this exactly right because what would happen at that moment if that were the case if jesus had taken up the sword with peter what would have happened? Well, it would have been a complete mess, obviously. And it would have undone the whole thing. And, and Jesus, of course, knows this. And, um, and he goes through the passion and he is crucified as a kind of declaration of something like death cannot be seen as failure. It cannot be seen, if, if you're, if you're going to put competence, let's go back to that. If you're going to put competence at the top, no, you're you're not going to be able to be competent enough to have that not happen, and so the the cross is a a declaration, an affirmative declaration that we that we that death is not failure, because if death is failure, then the whole then that's the end. Of, that's if narrative defines what you know what we take as meaningful, and death is failure, then. That's going to be all of our stories, and so I think this is that's kind of the it's a symbolic, but you know, well, let's say real for Christians, it's a real declaration that says that we could be in our incarnate life without that being the defining narrative. And I, I don't, I'll let you run. That's that. wonderful. <laughs> That'll preach. I'm I'm robbing that thing. <laughs> I'm robbing that thing hard. <laughs> that, I think that's, I think that's terrific. And I think that's right because, and, and that's, again, I think part of why the, the climate controversy is the perfect storm for rationality because the, the value implicit in the, the value implicit in the humanist rationalist project is in fact that, we can employ science and of course anything that we employ is by definition not at the top of the hierarchy because it is serving that which is employing it we can employ science in order to in order to beat death and um the you know this is why i love c.s lewis's life in an atomic age because you know in the late 40s everybody's freaking out because now now the soviets have the bomb too <laughs> And, and everyone's falling all over themselves. And C.S. Lewis said, well, what kind of world did you think you were living in? Which is exactly the right question. That, that, you, had, that you had imagined that, well, you had imagined both that, you know, maybe death isn't inevitable, or at least we can have death on our terms. But death is a failure and something which should be avoided. And... Lewis comes and, of course, as a Christian, says, well, number one, um, no, you're not getting out of, none of us are getting out of this alive. <laughs> right. And we all know that. But we have concocted an enormous culture around, you know, Beckett's term, the denial of death, CS, or, um, a book that Peterson thinks is a wonderful book, but deeply flawed, um, the denial of death. And 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 so then we can continue to live in this in this this life over here where we push it off and push it off and then when it happens well then we'll either kick over to religion and say they're in a better place or we take the, I find very few atheists mouth you know shooting their mouth off at, at gravesides personally to say well yeah. they're nothing now right <laughs> well that was a waste that <laughs> doesn't sell at the funeral. No. No. <laughs> No, I, I uh, Jim, this that was that was really I, I could not have said it any better myself, and um, that that's just simply uh, that's just simply fantastic, and and I love you know how you set up this scene in the garden too, because you know if you take the image of Jesus that we see in the Gospels of someone stilling a storm with a word, and someone raising the dead with a word, well, you want to talk about power. You know, 
Is it easier to make a storm? So one of the members of my congregation is involved in cloud seeding and some of those kind of things. Is it easier to make a storm or at least to enhance a storm or to still a storm? Is it easier to raise the dead or to cause death? Well, we've been causing death, you know. Seems like the obvious answer to that one is yeah. apparent. And so then, you know, the, the, the assumption in, as Gerard would say, the kingdom of Satan would be that Jesus would use his power to cause the death of his enemies. And he completely inverts that, and he refuses to use his power. In fact, he uses minor power to, you know, he calls his disciples off. He heals the servant's ear. He goes right. willingly to the cross. And, and, you know, all of the scenes in the Gospels, all of his trial scenes, make it abundantly obvious that and he, he didn't even need a lawyer to avoid the cross, Right. And a pilot's practically pleading with him, give me any excuse. I would love to stick it to these guys who are bringing it. I would love that. And, and my wife is, you know, talking in my ear, don't hurt this man. <laughs> give me any excuse at all not to crucify you. And, and Jesus, Jesus just simply will not play his game yeah. at, at any level. And that's where, in a, in a weird way, you know, Jesus and the Joker – you don't want to give too many spoilers, but there's a scene in yeah. that movie which is right out of classical Christian imagery. And, and Jesus, in a sense, like the Joker, simply defies every narrative that all the competing elements are bringing to him. And so they have no choice but to kill him. That's, yeah. that's all you can do with such a person. Yeah. And so then he's the victim and he's God. And right. <laughs> that's why, yeah. that's how Renee's uh, Gerard's stuff is so powerful. Yeah. I really, I'm really going to follow you along as you, as you dive into that, because I, I really find him to be fascinating for sure. Yeah. 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 It'll bring some good stuff. Let me, let me give a, a quick plug here. My son, I told you before, my son is in a band and there's one of his songs that I put in that email. It's called black magic. This, the band is called the slow and they're on Spotify and I'm, you know, it's just, it's just little local bands. So it's not like this is going to go anywhere. But I really think that song just kind of goes along with what we, my son's a really, he's a creative, smart, uh, you know, he's a very passionate kind of guy when he writes poetry and his poetry is in that song. So I just, uh, I, I just, Black Friday is the name of the song. On, on, on Friday. I will put the, I will put the, uh, I will put the and link. I, that's in that, e that's in that email there. Okay. I will put the link in the notes. Here's, and, here's the album right here. It's got an <laughs> and we'll, we'll, give, we'll give him a little bit of, well, who knows, you know, hey. if that artist, you know, heard of us, who knows where this reaches. I, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I was thinking, oh, you know, who knows what'll happen. So it's like, dad, could you talk to Paul Vanderclay again? Get, that, get my album up on his channel. He wouldn't, <laughs> no, he he would not be say the that. first. He would not say that. He could be embarrassed by this. But <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. That's okay. Well, Jim, this is this is wonderful as always, and and thanks for listening, and thanks. For oh, and another plug for Mary, I, I, just to say it out loud, Mary, I really, you know, Mary Cokin uh, is her name. Yeah, Cohen. I, I, Cohen, I really, I really like her stuff. So everybody should listen to her. She's a smart lady. Kind of crazy how I can't. Um, I here's my prejudice. I wouldn't have thought that someone coming from where she comes from, I would I would have been prejudiced against that person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and she yeah. is very impressive in that. And that just opens my eyes to a lot of things. And then she's reading Ratzinger, which is definitely worthy. So I just throw that plug out as well. Yeah, yeah. Mary, I, you know, and, and, and in fact, I need a few more female voices out there. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and Karen, too. Karen, Karen Wong, too, yeah. the, the stuff that she's doing, I'll, I'll often watch her stuff. And I'll, you know, she'll just, she'll just really spark ideas and, yep. I, the conversations that are going on on the Randos channel yep, and yep. I, I, it's, it's just been, it's just been wonderful. And um, there's, there's more, there's more good stuff out there than I have time to listen to, which is regrettable, yep. but that's as a Christian, I, I console myself because when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, mm -hmm. we've no less days to sing God's praise. And part of how we sing that praise is we, we have conversations and we listen and um, so come together. come together. That's right. That's right. So thank you, Jim. This has yep. been terrific. Thanks again. And I'll post this probably sometimes next, sometime next week. It'll get out there. Perfect. Thanks again, Paul. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yep.